Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm really excited and very honored to uh, be presenting this here. Um, I am going to be focusing on, uh, <laughs> as the slides say, prioritizing accessibility and custom things in Drupal 8. Uh, there has been an amazing amount of progress made in Drupal 8 for accessibility, especially for tools. And uh, this presentation will be pointing out uh, the different ways that you can use the tools, specifically in your custom themes, uh, to take what's available in Drupal 8 and really push it forward in terms of accessibility. Uh, that's me. I had brown hair. I guess I, you could still see most of it, uh, but now it's a funny color. Um, I am a technical architect at My Planet uh, in Canada. I've been doing Drupal work since six. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, and, um, one of the areas that I focus in is accessible front-end development. So we look at developing sites and applications for users that use assistive technology and organizations that have uh, requirements for accessibility. Uh, that is my Twitter handle. Uh, this presentation goes about an hour, so we may not have time for questions. If you have any questions, please hit me up there. And as I mentioned before, um, if you can see the URL at the top, these slides are live, so you can follow along with the links. There are a lot of links and resources in here. Um, but uh, if you cannot see it, it's uh, https colon slash slash emarchak dot github dot io slash closing dash uh, the slash gaps. Cool. And as I mentioned before, uh, I work at My Planet out of Toronto. What uh, My Planet focuses on is uh, building, engaging web and mobile products for the in enterprise. So what we're trying to do is to take the UX and the usability that you normally see in consumer level applications and bring that into enterprise uh, applications and workplace environments. So taking things that people don't expect to be beautiful and usable and making it beautiful and usable. Uh, we're at My Planet HQ. If you're ever in Toronto, come visit us. We can see a Jays game. So for the purposes of this presentation, uh, I'm going to be using a uh, not an acronym, but a shortening, a term, uh, A11Y or ALLI. Uh, this is a uh, normal acronym or uh, phrase to reference accessibility. It's because uh, there are 11 letters between the A and the Y in accessibility, so it makes sense and it's also pretty cute. Uh, I like it. So if you're ever confused about that, that's what it is. What am I going to cover? Uh, <laughs> why, why am I here? Not in like the philosophical sense, but in the why am I giving this talk sense. Um, and it's going to be a case study and a reasoning behind where we came to these discussions. I'm going to give an overview of accessibility uh, in and of itself, especially in terms of uh, web and mobile products. I'm going to give you an overview of accessibility and Drupal 8, so within that context. Um, for anybody who's not already well versed in it, that's going to be really useful. Uh, I'm then, then going to show you how to identify accessibility gaps in your applications. So I'm going to give you uh, developers, designers, uh, project managers, QA, some tools about how to identify areas that you need to improve. And then I'm going to go through some uh, real world examples on how you can actually fix that in your application as a developer or help fix that and help address the design gaps that yeah, you need to address. Uh, and finally, I'm going to give some further resources. So there's a lot. And I'm going to try to talk slow, even though there's a lot to cover. So why am I here? A case study. So on the slide, uh, we have uh, the title AMI, which is the Accessible Media Inc. And we have a screenshot of uh, their fully accessible website that we've created with them. Um, AMI is a company out of Canada. And what they do is they focus on accessible media. Um, and they're something similar to Rogers or Warner or uh, Sky Media that you would have here. Uh, but what they do is their role is to focus on um, bringing media to individuals that require uh, assistive technology. Um, one of their main targets is uh, blind and low vision users. And if they is, the idea is if they're successful at this, they'll go out of business because they need to be the business case for the larger players to demonstrate that you can have a profitable and accessible media platform. So they're just amazing, amazing, amazing people. And um, what MindPlanet did is we engaged with them to help build their new media platform. 
So it was on, it is on uh, Drupal 8. It's uh, fully accessible and compliant for level two. It is multilingual because it is Canada and we have to support the two uh, official languages. And it's entirely accessible, which I said. Um, so users can go in, uh, they can see a schedule of descriptive video. Um, so similar to TV Guide, but they can go through and find uh, content that's specifically uh, available for them in their area with their cable provider. They can watch videos online. Uh, they can listen to uh, radio shows online and it has closed captioning and descriptive video and an accessible media player within there. So it's really focused, in, focused on catering to um, that community and there's also targeted content there. So it was a really, really uh, big build. Um, but the nice thing about it is that the mission for the site was, it's really, really easy to get on board with that idea. And uh, us at my planet, uh, we worked with the design team and we went through the whole uh, design audits, design processes, we did the entire build. And at each point, we were more and more aligned with what AMI was trying to do because it's such a great and such an important mission. Um, on this slide, uh, we have our product owner, Sai, in front of a board uh, that shows the different designs and how we broke them out. And then we have a screenshot of uh, my PHP storm with some Drupal 8 code. Uh, with uh, what my planet did here is we did uh, specific user experience testing, which we normally do for any enterprise application. Uh, but this was specifically targeted toward accessibility and um, engaging those communities. So I'm going to, further on, I'll show you what that actually means. Uh, we did design audits of the designs um, in terms of creating uh, the comps and creating the wireframes out of the designs. They were intended to be accessible from the start. And uh, we just went through with a fine tooth comb and confirmed that and verified that. Uh, we worked with David McDonald, who is an accessibility expert in Canada and does work with the WC3 uh, a lot. Um, and he did accessibility audits of the designs and just general reviews at each stage of the project. Uh, we were also uh, really lucky to have uh, Everett Zufeld, who was the accessibility maintainer of Drupal 7 and a coworker of mine and just a really nice friend there as a technical consultant and make sure that there was lots of eyes on the project working around. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, finally, um, something that isn't focused on accessibility, but we're also really proud of, is uh, we had headless or decoupled components uh, using React.js on top of Drupal to have that really nice dynamic experience. And well, we were able to do it entirely accessibly. So there was a lot of stuff going on. So this slide has a GIF of, oh man, uh, RuPaul in a large white wig. Uh, with the text, put your money where your mug is. So this is what we did. Um, <laughs> and so the intent of this presentation is, uh, we did this, we have all this information, and I would like to share it with you. So th this demonstrates in the same way that AMI demonstrates to um, the large media players, that uh, you can have an accessible site, you can have a beautiful, aesthetically pleasing site, and you can have a usable site, and you don't have to compromise on any of those. And I really think that, it, that it's important as uh, technologists that we understand that we can be our best. And because we're told so many times that we have to compromise this for that and cut this there and keep scope in. But when you have a, when you build things out uh, initially, uh, w whether it's uh, you're focusing on accessibility, security, uh, forward compatibility, you're able to bake these things in if you already have the base knowledge. So that's why I think this presentation is really important. Cool. So that's the background, that's why I'm here. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about accessibility in Drupal 8. And to know about accessibility in Drupal 8, you kinda need to know about accessibility. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, so uh, it's a little bit, the colors are very light on this screen, I'm sorry. Um, but the, uh, on the slide is the quote uh, by Tim Berners-Lee, who is largely attributed to be the founder of the internet, and a cool dude, um, is the power of the web is in its universality. And that can mean a lot of things, but uh, for me, that means that it's universally accessible. Uh, whether we're talking about needing to use assistive technology, 
or um, needing to uh, accommodate for different uh, screen profiles or data types or just usages. The fact that we have this tool here, that we have the power to build and can distribute applications and documents to others, uh, literally around the world, and maybe Mars in 2016, um, the, uh, that's its real power. And to have that as something that motivates you and to, uh, brings you forward to really inspire you to push things forward uh, is great. I like it. I'm going to get teary. I'm sorry. Um, so things that will prevent uh, users from actually accessing your content uh, are different barriers there. And when thinking about accessibility um, on the web, we normally think about a very uh, narrow kind of example. Um, some of the barriers here that we don't talk about, or I'm just going to go through a bunch. <laughs> um, well, some of the type of barriers are physical, motor, or mobile. So this could be that the user is unab unable to use a mouth, a mouth, mouse, it could be. Um, a mouse, when engaging with uh, your device, that could be because they are unable to physically move the mouse. It could be because the mouse is broken. Uh, not ha being able to have uh, understanding that there are different ways to engage uh, with your device is really, really important. Uh, visual. So uh, the standard example of a visual barrier is somebody who is blind or low vision. And we see that a lot. Uh, in terms of usage of examples. Um, but visual might also be colorblind. And that's a demographic that I really think is uh, largely ignored for no good reason, um, is that uh, the not being able to understand or parse the colors <coughs> on your page uh, can be a great barrier, whether or not it is you because you are colorblind or because your device's screen it just can't render the color properly. Um, auditory. So uh, if you're deaf of heart or hard of hearing, again, is a dramatic example. Um, on the other scale, an example of a barrier could be for uh, auditory information is the barrier could be you don't have speakers, or you're in a cafe and you don't have your headphones, or perhaps you don't want to actually, you're listening to good music and you don't want to turn on this music. So there's different, these are barriers that, uh, we implement ourselves, but barriers that exist to uh, engaging with your mobile content or your web application. Uh, learning barrier. So this example is a, a very easy one of that is um, dyslexia. So how, do, yeah. Um, so how people are able to learn and interpret uh, your technology and your information, um, and making sure that people are able to take the time that they need to actually go through and consume and understand your application in a good pace. Speech or language. Um, we talk a lot about having uh, verbal interfaces, so Alexa or uh, Siri, uh, with your application. And if you are unable to communicate with that, whether you have a um, difficulty with speech or uh, your accent isn't the one that the device is expecting, um, that, uh, that is a barrier. Uh, whether or not you understand the language that the uh, interface is in is another barrier. So if um, in Canada, it's uh, the, the example is a French user going to an English site that isn't able to understand the English words. Um, it's a really good example of a barrier. And normally we don't think about these as barriers because we're so focused on our target market. But uh, you don't know who's coming to your application because the web is universal. Um, and then finally, whether it's a mental, intellectual, or developmental barrier. Uh, so whether or not they're able to properly understand and comprehend in a higher level uh, your content, whether they're in a good mind space to even deal with your content, if it's a uh, mental health concern. Uh, th these are type of barriers that we find uh, we're starting to get into, but it, there's, no large, um, there's no large discussion regarding it. So I just talked about a bunch of barriers, and that's super <laughs> negative and sad. Here are some types of solutions that we can actually use. Uh, so for mobility, uh, being able to have redundant ways to engage with your application besides just a mouse, like this is a very basic thing. Um, so I can use keyboard or mouse or touch navigation, and my uh, application works across all of these. Uh, screen reader compatibility and descriptive video for people who don't have the uh, oral not oral, aural, whatever, sound, 
uh, sound capabilities uh, within there. And I really want to emphasize that I use descriptive video and uh, captioning so much because I don't like to turn my audio on. And you can see that Facebook has standardized this now. When you go through the feed, they actually have the captioning on by default. So it's uh, captioning is another thing um, with uh, different content being able to actually caption properly and descriptively capture what's going on is so, so important. Um, legibility of design and information architecture is a, and clear information architecture is a great way to get around the learning barrier. Uh, so people have uh, legible text. There's this awesome example of how the lowercase l and the uppercase i in sans serif fonts look exactly the same. And it's not only an issue for people uh, with dyslexia, but like it's real confusing for technologists because I need to know what that character is because I'm one of those control freaks. Um, but uh, legible design and clear information architecture allows people to properly parse your information at their own pace. Uh, for speech, translatable content, uh, where Drupal's great in multilingual, and I'm sure a lot of people here work uh, directly with multilingual content. But to have the, even if your content isn't multilingual at release, to have that capability baked in and to have an awareness as a technologist to say there, there could be potentially in the future my app goes big and I have to translate it into 30 different languages. Um, building that in is so, so important. Uh, and then in terms of the uh, mental, uh, intellectual or developmental uh, barriers, uh, trigger warnings for content. If you have content that is uh, particularly uh, strong in a, in a direction, sometimes it's nice to just give people a heads up. We talk about, um, I've seen a lot of people say like, ah, it's, Safe spaces, they're just too safe, um, which sounds weird. But having trigger warnings and having uh, discussion and context for your content is really important because you don't know what kind of person is accessing this. Uh, I am the biggest wuss, and now on Facebook, they're auto-playing trailers for horror movies. And it just, I, I can't. <laughs> uh, I wish that there was a way that I could turn that off, but I can't because they've assumed that uh, I just want to engage with it and there's no kind of preparation for like, oh, scroll past this because Aaron, you're gonna get scared and cry again. Um, so uh, on this slide, uh, there is a image of three people watching a uh, baseball game. I don't think they're the Toronto Blue Jays, but it's a baseball game. And on one side of the image, they're trying to look over a fence and each of them has a box. There's a person who's very tall that can see over the fence, the person who's uh, middle tall that can see over the fence, and then a shorter person who cannot see over the fence. On the other side of the image, uh, and sorry, and that side is captioned uh, equality. So everyone has equal access to uh, the technology, which is a box to stand on. Uh, on the opposite side of the image, uh, it shows that the taller, it's the same image, the taller person is able to look over the fence without a box. The middle height person uh, uses one box to look over the fence. And then the shorter person uh, uses two boxes and they're able to look over the fence and it's captioned justice. And I think that this is what we need to be aware um, as technologists that are building applications is that some people need uh, and use more of our technology than others to access it. They deeply use any semantic HTML, which I'll talk about, and uh, any kind of proper translation or language. Um, and they use that more to access the content. There are people who don't use that at all and they're able to access our content. And to understand uh, the differences and to make sure that we are able for everyone to have a great time at the old ball game uh, is important. Cool, so that's Aaron's high level. Um, who here has heard of the W3C? Can you please raise your hand, give a shout or dance? Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> okay, I should have asked that to begin with. Um, the W3C has the accessibility guidelines. Um, they have not changed since 2008. The guidelines haven't. Um, and this is the general recommendation of uh, the guidelines. I'm gonna be going through these slides fairly quickly since a lot of people raise their hands. But if you need to access this and if you need more information on it, uh, please go to the slides. All the links are there. Um, there are multiple levels of the Web Content Accessibility Guides, or WCAG. 
Uh, level A is essential. This means that people will be un entirely unable to access your site without this. This is the first box that they're standing on in the image before. Um, level two is preferred. So uh, this means that uh, the majority of users will be able to access the majority of your content without significant barriers. And finally, uh, the levels that the guidelines provide, uh, level three is optimal. Uh, it means that there are no significant barriers for anybody to access your content and it's largely universal. Uh, when we were working on AMI, the general discussion and the general comments were that level uh, AAA, so level three, is designed as a goal. It's designed as inherently inachievable. Um, this would be ideal perfection. So not to say that the guidelines, uh, when you can hit some of the requirements for AAA, uh, that's ideal. But when building a site, what uh, you need to focus on is making sure that the entire site is actually just AA compliant. Um, and the key points of the interactions to really make the experience beautiful, let's say your main uh, functionality of it, is uh, AAA. So you're, a you're not able to, um, the general discussion that we had uh, with David, uh, with Everett, and with AMI is that AAA is just, um, it's an ideal. It's the platonic ideal of entire ex accessibility. And for you to reach that, it's generally inachievable. But the act of trying is important. So making sure that your uh, application or uh, document is AA uh, is perfect. Because it's AA certified, you've hit all the AA points, and then you really stretch yourself for the few key points for AAA. I feel like you should like raise your hand up if you want to say, actually trying is important. Uh, the, uh, an audience, so this is for the recording and anybody that can hear. An audience member said, uh, the act of trying is important, which I think, I think my mom said that to me too. Um, but it is, it is. And it's not trying that gets us in trouble. And it's not pushing the boundaries. And we're at DrupalCon. And we're here pushing the boundaries of technology. We're push, pushing the boundaries of what our technology can do. Let's push the boundaries of who can use it also. Ah. Um, so on this slide, I have links to the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or IOTA which uh, requires um, all of the Canadian government um, sites and all of the Ontario uh, public and large private uh, companies to have accessible content as an example of uh, what's required in Canada. In the US, they have Section 508, uh, the Accessibility Program, which is targeted towards government companies, not government companies, whew. Uh, <laughs> um, government organizations uh, required to provide accessible content uh, to their end users. And the European Union does have basic accessibility requirements for any of the governmental uh, websites on there. So there are legal requirements for accessibility that uh, we have to be aware of as technologists. And understanding where your client is coming from, who they're serving, uh, being aware of what's re legally required is also important. So if you can't motivate yourself or motivate others from a deeply inspirational speech, um, you can motivate them <laughs> through legal uh, means, which is good and but sad, but sometimes that's how we move forward. It's the carrot and the stick. Cool. How am I doing for time? Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, so accessibility in Drupal 8. Um, could you raise your hand if you've built a Drupal 8 site with some accessibility improvements? Okay, cool. So, da -da 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 -da. Uh, about 50-50. Um, just as an overview, the uh, Drupal 8 has a initiative called the Drupal 8 Accessibility Experience, DATAX. I don't know. Um, the, but the Drupal 8 Accessibility Experience has largely been a uh, follow through from the Drupal 7 Accessibility Experience. And we've taken what we've learned and what we've developed in Drupal 7 and really pushed the boundaries in 8. Um, but if you want to get involved or uh, participate in the Drupal 8 Accessibility, Experience, Accessibility Initiative, you can go onto drupal.org and Drupal. Um, so some of the benefits uh, that we've 
accessible accessibility benefits that we've rolled into Drupal 8 is uh, Y ARIA. So that's the um, Web Accessibility Initiatives Accessible Rich Internet Application Guidelines. What? Um, I've also linked to articles in these slides. Uh, a lot of them are by Mike Gifford out of Open Concept out of Ottawa, uh, who is the Drupal 8 accessibility maintainer and has largely pushed uh, for these changes and been a, real gr a really, really, really great inspiration and motivation for this whole process. Um, but ARIA is a specifically targeted markup designed for accessibility um, and connected semantics within your documents. Uh, and allowing you to have accessible, <laughs> rich internet applications, ARIA. Um, and a lot of that has been rolled into HTML5 specification. So ARIA exists outside the HTML specification. HTML5 uh, has um, consumed some of that and has used that to help us with improved semantics on our websites. Uh, but it also means that the improved semantics connect to improved accessibility. Because if you're not using, um, if you're using a device that needs to parse and interpret a web page, whether you're using a web crawler uh, to go through a page, the semantics help the uh, web crawler understand it. And also if you ha are using an accessibility device or accessibility tool, the improved semantics help explain it uh, to the user. And I'm gonna be demonstrating this. But uh, using these improved semantics are actually great accessibility improvements. I have more links here. You can read about it uh, on the slides. Again, highly recommend you take, take a look at the slides. Um, but within there, we have a great amount of ability to just out of the box, we already have a more descriptive uh, website. Uh, we have an improved content authoring experience and a tag uh, compliance and a tag is authoring tools accessibility guidelines. I hope I remembered that. Anyway, um, yes, thank you. So what is awesome is that we can, with Drupal 8, it's very easy to build accessible front-end websites, but if you have somebody that needs to use an assistive device or assistive technology to add the content in, in Drupal 7, it was like impossible. God forbid you try to use views with a keyboard in Drupal 7. Um, but with a tag, we actually have the ability, the views UI is now accessible, people can engage with it, and the improved content authoring experience uh, within there helps guide, ah, oh, shoot my goop, um, helps guide uh, content authors in creating accessible content. So you can create a beautiful front end, but uh, if the content authors don't follow guidelines or accessibility or they're not trained, they'll break that. An example of this is now uh, alternative text on images is required in Drupal core in the image field by default. And you need to have those descriptive images uh, or the alt tags in the images as descriptions. Uh, tab control, there is so many, uh, <laughs> one of the big difficulties of creating a dynamic and rich internet application is that there's gonna be a lot of complex uh, interactions with it. And if you're using a mouse, uh, it's one thing. And if you're using a keyboard where you have to control where your keyboard is going and where your tab control is going, uh, it becomes more difficult. There is a tab control library in Drupal 8 now that you can use mm -hmm -hmm, to constrain tabbing and to control where the uh, keyboard user is going. So if you have, a, let's say, a really complicated menu or a, a game or an interactive modal, you can release and control tabbing to allow users to have a greater experience. Uh, finally, there are oral alerts, and this is, why is it always clicking? Don't be clicking. Um, within here, this is the same thing. Uh, I'll zoom the screen a little bit up. Uh, there's now Drupal announced in JavaScript. So frequently when you're engaging with rich internet applications, there are uh, messages that pop up or you get a notification that something is happening. Uh, before we would have to roll our own version of that, so you would have 15 different versions of this. Um, which you would do with the ARIA Live role. But uh, Drupal 8 gives us a nice standard way to pass translatable strings 
to Drupal announce that reads it out for the user. So if you have a, um, the, the easiest one is a chat screen. If you're using Drupal for your front end and you have uh, chatting going on, you have the ability to uh, announce to the user that there's a new message if they don't have the visual, in the, if they're not able to take the visual indication as information. So yeah, one of the examples is you look beautiful today and I think everyone looks beautiful here. Um, cool. So if you're interested in more uh, about the history and about the development of accessibility in Drupal 8, uh, Mike Gifford did an amazing, amazing talk at DrupalCon New Orleans that talks about the history of the development and where we're going and some of the difficulties we have with it. I really recommend that if you're looking for more context uh, regarding it and it is available online. So this slide has, uh, oh man, Taylor the Creator uh, in the video and it's captioned with, I think I'm wasting my damn time. So if you already know all this information, you're like, so? I know this, I am excellent, Aaron, great. Uh, given all of this information, why do we need to know the whole history of it to the whole understanding the different kinds of barriers to actually build internet applications when there are guidelines out there and there are check boxes that we can just go through and check? The reason why I talked about all of this is that for AMI, remember, uh, we didn't want a technically accessible site. We didn't want to go through and check all the check boxes and make sure people can use it. We wanted a really engaging, rich experience for users on the site. Uh, on this slide, they have that quote that I just said, and there's a picture of me talking to uh, Hoyen, one of our uh, product strategists, and us testing on multiple devices. The reason why it's important to understand the tools and understand the uh, barriers and the solutions for people to engage with your website is that if you want to take something that is okay, it's accessible, it's the emotional equivalent of just checking a box when you pass the guidelines, you need to understand and you need to deeply empathize with what the user is going through. And to do that, you need to be able to put, it to put yourself in their shoes, to have representation and to have discussion within there. And by understanding the tools available in Drupal 8 by understanding the guidelines, you're able to take what's uh, Drupal 8, which is already fairly accessible, and push it and make it beautifully accessible. So it's not only just universally accessible, it's universally usable. And that's gonna be the difference when you're uh, talking and catering to the users of your application, is whether or not they can use it versus whether or not they want to use it. And that's, what's a, that's what I feel is very important. So, I have built my application, it's on Drupal 8, I've used all of these technologies. How do I actually start identifying where we can take something that's okay accessible and really push it to be awesomely accessible? So, uh, I'm gonna go through different kinds of testing that you can do. With visual testing, this is testing the designs going through the design audits um, what you can do to identify uh, areas that you can improve is making sure that uh, the designers plan the heading structure early. For search engine optimization, it's not really required to have semantic SEO experts are gonna argue about this in both directions, so whatever. Um, that's my two cents. Uh, planning the heading structure early because accessible technology really uses the semantic H1, H2, H3, H4, and to understand what the different heading, headings level mean and what they're communicating on the page. So this is again just visual, um, but as a designer you need to have a uh, visual pattern and visual um, indicators of what's going on on the page so people can understand that. And to directly map that to understand this is the first heading that I want them to see, then we're gonna follow the page. Uh, you create the user journey very clearly on the document. And uh, the second one I have that I suggest is prioritize function over form. If you're a visual designer, really prioritize and look at how people are gonna be using the application you're designing. Um, look at the functionality of it before you start adjusting the form or the visuals of it. The, uh, it's nice to have um, some of these dynamic, <laughs> uh, some of the more frilly parts of the web. Uh, we've ha always had issues with drop shadows. Um, but I think that that's gone now from design. 
but prioritizing how people are going to be using the site and how they're able to use it over the uh, the sparkle and the um, yeah the the visual flare sorry flare of the page. So uh, look at functionality, uh, communicate clearly about what's going on on the page, communicate the function uh, before you communicate the form. And finally, allow indicators. Uh, these are visually, these are icons, uh, colors, shapes, allow redundant indicators, so even text versions of it. So if something happens on the page, they can potentially get a sound, a visual indicator, a textual indicator, and um, Da, 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 a verbal indicator that it's actually happening. Um, and to communicate that something has changed on the page, to communicate state properly as a designer is gonna be really, really, really helpful in terms of usability and accessibility. Uh, if there's a form error, make sure that the uh, error state is clearly designed is a base example of that. Automated functional testing. So great, you've developed your website, um, you've passed the designs onto the team, uh, they now have built it, and they're like, "Huh, I guess we should see if it's accessible. There are, I have two examples here, and there are others you can get. Uh, the Wave Toolbar by WebAIM is, oh, I have it preloaded uh, with a DrupalCon. You can go onto webaim.org and generate a report for, the, uh, for any website that's online, and it'll give you a breakdown of the errors, uh, the features, the structure elements, and its general understanding of the page. You can also do this on your local. So here uh, I have an example of a local site that I've built in Drupal 8. This site is using the stable theme uh, with the bootstrap, like Twitter bootstrap CSS applied, because I don't like that font. Um, and I have the WebAIM toolbar installed. I can click the toolbar on top of my screen, and it gives me uh, an assessment of just a local uh, Page. And you can see clearly that I have an empty heading element. I have an empty H1 on the page that I should probably fix. And as you go through uh, the web, web AIM toolbar, um, or sorry, web AIM accessibility evaluation tool, whatever, uh, gives you context and ways to understand the different errors. So it's a really good way uh, to kind of start guiding you, yourself through best practices and um, yeah, the different guidelines of what it is that you need. And it gives you feedback on features, so positive little check boxes, and general discussion of it. The other thing that you can do uh, and use is Tenon.io, which is an automated testing tool that you can use to plug in with your continuous integration to test generated pages. So I'm going to, yeah, let's take Drupal.org. Uh, Drupal.org and pass it to Tenon. We'll see if it works. This is live. This isn't a video, so please forgive me. Sweet. So um, we found some issues. We found some benefits. They generally go through and describe what's happening on the page. And you can, as I said before, plug this into Travis.ci to have automated testing on your site. Other things that you can do is uh, manual functional testing. So uh, beyond automation, really go in and try and understand how the user's testing it. Uh, who here has an accessibility device on their phone, an accessibility tool? Who here uses an iPhone? All of you should have had your hands up for the first question. Um, the, there's voiceover, and also I cheated because it's on the slide. There's voiceover for uh, Mac OS and iOS. It comes with it. Uh, Siri is another accessibility tool, uh, but you can turn it on on your phone. Uh, and on the Mac, I'm going to show it uh, <laughs> later. I'll show you voiceover later. It's really easy. Uh, Talkback comes by default with most Android uh, applications. Uh, so you can test on Android there. Uh, NVDA is an open source and free screen reader for Windows. So you can test on that. And JAWS is a uh, non-open source proprietary one for Windows. It is one of the most popular ones out there. Uh, so if you are getting serious about uh, screen reader testing, you may need to look into uh, investing in a JAWS um, license. The JAWS license, I believe, is over $1,000. So it's a great barrier for people to stay upgraded and stay with the up-to-date version. So a lot of accessibility testing is making sure that you're backwards compatible, at least for accessibility uh, in terms of that functionality. 
uh, user experience testing. So I touched on this before. Um, the final point of this is to really understand how people are using and experiencing your application. So how we do this is uh, we get pairs of researchers. So one person creates a script where they're asking users uh, what they're expecting when they're using the site. And the other person is taking notes. And they go through the script and they ask, uh, what do you expect from this uh, page of my application or this page of the site? And then they get users to actually use the site and go through. And they, what we do is we're looking for uh, behaviors and attitudes. So is this something pleasurable to the user? Do they get frustrated or lost? Um, or is this, uh, do I expect them, is the thing that I expect them to engage with, the button that I'm expecting them to click, actually the button that they're using? So you're really able to test call to action, verbiage, design, and visual indicators for it. Great, so we now have found all the problems with our application. <laughs> How do I fix it? Uh, <laughs> functional solutions. So here's to, if there's a problem with your site, here's how you can fix it. And I went through and I pulled some of the um, uh, most standard ones that we found and stuff that we repeated ourselves and I dropped it into my uh, theme. So landmark labels. So this, I have the, uh, all my slides are on GitHub. Uh, and if you go to this URL, which is emarcheck slash closing the gaps, uh, this theme is actually available there as a Drupal 8 theme that you can use and base off of. So all the code there is what I'm going to be demoing today. Uh, this is a live demo. Be nice. <laughs> uh, we'll see how far we get. Woo, do, do, do. Okay. So step one was landmark labels. So I mentioned before that we have uh, ARIA landmarks and uh, ARIA tags in HTML5. Uh, here, I have an example of the main tag, so that's an HTML5 main uh, tag, sure, uh, with the ARIA role of main, so that's kind of redundant, but you understand what's happening here. I'm indicating that this is the main part of my page. Uh, there are other landmarks within there, uh, and I'll be showing you the different ones. Uh, largely, these come with uh, core, um, and I'll be tweeting and posting the links afterwards, so we're good. Uh, I also have the ARIA attribute ARIA label, and that label uh, is the translatable verbal text that labels the element. And uh, what we found is that you have to be very aware of what your label is and include a label when uh, designing it. So this is how you turn voiceover on um, in OS X. There's gonna be a visual indicator that I've turned on and I also have the vo verbal commands turned on. So we're gonna be getting a lot of information here, but it's fine. Welcome to OS 10. VoiceOver is on. System preferences. Chrome. Closing the gaps. Vertical home. Documentation. Selected okay. tab. Drupal so Ava, I'm here. Tab. Visited internal link. Skip to main content. Visited internal link. Uh, you can see that I have the visual indicator at the bottom and the uh, VoiceOver is reading through it. Uh, if I go to uh, my landmarks tab, I have here, I have the brand banner. I have main navigation navigation. User account menu navigation. And what I had before, which was content main. So it's reading the ARIA role of main, and it's appending the ARIA label to how it's reading it out. Content main right there. And you can see here, role, content main here. I'm just going to mute that for a bit. And I'll, I'll show you what it is on there. But uh, this indicates and this shows you where are we at, Drupal? Where are we at, Drupal? I'll just find it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can totally turn it on. Um, here's another one. So I had the banner, uh, and again, this is available on the repo, so you can take a look at it. Uh, sorry that this is so small, but I have the banner, uh, the header of a role banner, and uh, headers have a banner role. It's just read out as banner in OS X, and the ARIA label brand. And if I go back to my um, landmark navigation, the brand banner is there. So you can see that there's, that's how you can connect, and uh, one, that's one way accessibility uh, users engage with the site. The other way uh, I'll get into, but one of the problems that we have 
is that you need semantic names of your elements. So here I have a nav element that is a nav role, and it's taking the uh, name of the ARIA label uh, main navigation. So the, it's read out main navigation navigation, which isn't an ideal experience to the user. Um, here I would need to change the default Drupal uh, menu to say main menu, and that would be corrected. I also have, so you can see here, uh, this is the theme that I was again referencing in GitHub page here. This is the element that I was referencing before, if you can see it there. So it was reading main content within that. Cool. Right, I mentioned before, this is not an accessible presentation. Another one that we noticed, um, a lot of pagination when you're doing your custom themes. Uh, there are custom pagination elements. The requirement there uh, that we ran into a lot is the verbal, or sorry, the visual tools to indicate what uh, the button does. So here, I have next, and then just a little like chevron arrow on the side. It's not enough to describe really what's going on to the user. So the ideal thing that we did is have uh, two text elements on there. Uh, one that says next with a little fancy arrow, a little chevron for visual users. And we've tagged that with aria hidden. So it's hidden uh, from the screen reader. But we give a more verbal description of what's going on using the Drupal core class visually hidden. So there's indicators for uh, visual users, if you just have a button or if you're using a font icon, and then indicators for keyboard users that are uh, engaging with it. And I have that here within a pager. Another one that uh, I would recommend in general, uh, this, this file pager stable I don't have in the repo, but this is the one that comes out of core, and I'm gonna be submitting a patch to this. Uh, one pattern that we've seen that is actually not great is including a title on a link. So this is the link. It's a, uh, a anchor tag, a ref, uh, with text that says last page and last. Uh, and then the title says go to last page. The majority of screen readers don't read out titles on links. You have to actually enable that manually. So uh, this is entirely lost. Um, if you have a question, you can tweet me or we'll go afterwards. So uh, that's a general indicator uh, of what's going on there. And you can see here as I turn on voiceover, mm -hmm -hmm. so I go to my pagination navigation. <laughs> ah, you can't see it. There it is. And I engage with that. Uh, so it says press link, current page one. Oh, I press the link. Mm -hmm. So I'm within there. Oh, no, this is the live demo. You're welcome, guys. Let's get back to it. Perfect. So end of navigation, end of list, visited the link, next page, last page. So you can see an example here that it's reading out last page, which is the uh, aria hidden tag that I've written there, and then next. And then I have uh, text in the same pattern that says go to page two, which is a clear indication of the link. Another way that p uh, users engage with the, your site, um, and through testing we found this, uh, there's a lot of different ways. Sometimes they just go through the links to find what they want. Um, so having uh, descriptive anchor tag elements, having descriptive links uh, within there really helps if this is how they're engaging the site. So I really should have, here, I should have said go to last page. That's a mistake on mine. But just to be aware of that. I'll turn this off. Um, another thing we found uh, with accessibility is that there's an issue with NVDA screen readers in Firefox. Um, this is not something that I think that uh, I should be committing to core, but to get around that, uh, NVDA Firefox users cannot access uh, HTML required 
attributes on fields properly. So the, what we found is if they have required and they start typing text in, it just gives them an immediate error. Uh, to solve this, we actually enable inline form errors, that uh, experimental module. So, um, and I'll show you how it engages with it when it's enabled. No, ah, that's my Drupal console patch I'm working on. Here we go, so t I'm enabling voiceover. I'm gonna go to user login. On this page, I'm gonna create an account. Great. So I'm gonna create an account here. Um, a valid email address is required. I'm choosing not to include that. I'm just gonna submit the form. Create new account, there it is. I submit the form. Excuse me, there we go. Ah, what's going on here? And again, this is unstyled, so it's a little bit hard to see. Two errors have been found, email address and username. The benefit and the reason why inline form errors is so important is that uh, when I go there as a keyboard user, I get a uh, content info error. Uh, I have, dis because they're using the title within there, the error messages are quite clear to me. Heading level, error message is two. I have two items, two errors have been found. I'm able to go into the list, the email address. I enter that and I'm able to enter my email address directly. So it's a really nice experience for accessibility users. Um, and that's what, in general, we recommend is we remove the uh, HTML5 required attributes and just handle that through inline form validation. Uh, another one is uh, we found that the picture element, uh, so the responsive image element, sometimes in some browsers, it's not able to actually read the alternative text of the image inserted in it. So what we ended up doing to get around that, and this is the uh, responsive image template within the theme. Uh, we insert the image as a fallback, so that, that's the actual image tag within your HTML5 picture element. Some screen readers can't pick that up if you're using a browser that understands the picture element. So we just inserted the text visually hidden. So this is using the Drupal accessibility class to hide it from visual users but we just put a paragraph in there that actually adds the alternative text. So it's read out. Uh, Google's able to still use the uh, alt text in there uh, to categorize and to crawl the images. But in addition to that, we just have the descriptive text. Boom. Um, given the time, I'm not gonna go into this, but with skip to main content, there, uh, what we found is that uh, the skip to main content link in Drupal 8, and I can use, actually, I don't actually need to turn uh, voiceover on for this. I can use just the keyboard navigation, skip to main content. Uh, we find that having JavaScript to handle that scroll allows you to visually create a nice scroll on the page for users who are using the keyboard and still visual users. If you don't have that JavaScript scroll element, it just jumps. Um, and it also manually handles anything um, that a browser is not able to properly handle. Again, we had issues with Firefox uh, properly passing the focus, so we just did that with JavaScript. And I have an example of the uh, code that actually handles the JavaScript to so scroll down in that theme. Finally, uh, this is one that I really like to talk about, uh, relating block and title labels. What I talked about right now is a lot of stuff that's in HTML5 that you may have experienced uh, as a cited user. But one of the things that's really important is being able to relate, when you have a block on the page, uh, being able to relate the call to action that's associated with the content and the title. So if I go back to my theme on the front end, where did my block go? All okay. right, well the classes aren't loading properly, that's fine. Um, but here I have a custom block at the bottom. I have the text within the block and I have a read more button that's connected to my custom block or my custom title. So uh, this would be a CTA, this would be a call out that you have. Um, what you can use here, uh, and this is the ARIA attribute labeled by, um, you have the ability to create complex associations 
within your page using this for IDs. So um, on the template block, I have uh, my heading ID, which is the uh, ID of the heading element, that's H2. So if I was to go here and inspect it, my custom block heading, that's my ID. And then on the call to action link at the bottom, I say it's labeled by itself. Um, I'll show you the code here. The uh, button, my call to action button, it's labeled by itself and it's labeled by the heading. And we do this uh, instead of just writing the text as a title or text as an alt text or a hidden because we want to give semantic reasoning and semantic connections between the header of the call to action and the actual call to action. So I mentioned before, um, some screen reader users just go through and read all the links on the page. I'll show you what this actually looks like uh, for your user. So I go here, I go through the links. There it is, I'm going through all my generic code. And uh, you can see here it's now focused on the read more block and it says read more, which is the text of my button, which is the first of the ARIA label IDs, a custom block, which is the second of the ARIA label IDs and it's the text of the title. So you ab you're able to have a uh, context and relation between the blocks. And it means that if I'm an uh, accessibility user that only uses, this is an actual way that people just go through the site. Some people wait for the page to read entirely. Some people just go through the links. Some people just go through the headings. There's all different ways that people engage with the site. Um, but this is one of the things that you can do. Cool. Mm -hmm -hmm. I told you this would take a long time. I apologize. So uh, some of the solutions, I talked about technical solutions. Now I'm going to talk about experiential solutions. So how can you solve uh, the non-technical problems? Um, visual design best practices, what I mentioned before. These, uh, if you check early and check often, uh, you're going to be able to prevent yourself going down an accessibility hole and uh, have to rework a bunch of your designs. There are other things that you can use to functionally test your designs while you're designing them. Uh, if you use Sketch, which uh, a lot of our designers do, there's a color contrast analyzer. And one of the issues is to make sure that you have a lot of contrast on the page so people can read it properly. Uh, an example of that is I didn't have enough contrast on my Tim Berners-Lee slide here, so it was hard to read. Um, checking it there is great. Uh, WebAIM, that does the toolbar that I was showing you before, also has a checklist that you can print off and go through. Uh, and there's a lot of really good information there that uh, illustrates uh, different things that you have to be aware of. So uh, contrast, content, uh, using true text as opposed to other font alternatives. Um, that's an ideal setup. User testing best practices. And uh, what we did with this was uh, when we did our user testing with accessibility in mind on AIM, uh, we did a mix of in-person and remote. So when you're in person, uh, the user testers are sitting in the same room as the other person and you're going through and you're engaging with them. Uh, you get a lot more information from being able to read their attitude and their tone uh, with that. And we did also remote, which means that uh, you're able to, you, we set up a phone call uh, with the tester and uh, they verbally describe what they were going through on the page. Normally, uh, when we do this for uh, non-accessibility, non-accessible user testing, we actually do a screen share. But because of the content of this, and because the users normally don't uh, use the visuals of the screen, we just did this over the phone. Um, the benefit of remote is two things. Uh, one, you gain access to people that aren't able to come in physically to your spaces. And uh, when you're talking about accessibility, there's a lot of groups that are uh, that have difficulty with mobility, and so you're able to engage them in a much easier and more comfortable environment. The second one, specifically for testing with blind and low vision users, is having somebody describe something that they're going through over the phone verbally puts you in the same situation as them. Um, I was doing a, uh, we did testing and uh, one user clicked a link and they said the menu was gone and then they said the page was gone and then they couldn't find out how to go back and they said the website must have been down. And we thought the whole site went down and the whole site tanked and we were, they were upset, we were upset and it turns out that they clicked a link that we didn't catch that opened up a tab in a new browser and they couldn't go back. And that was it, that was the solution. But as a visual user, I can clearly see, oh, I'm in a new tab, oh, I just closed the tab and you move back and you're fine. But understanding what they went through and understanding how frustrating it is when just a site breaks for no reason 
uh, really, really, really brings your, uh, was really, really empathetic and a really powerful experience to me. It definitely made me check a little bit of my privilege. Um, bring your own device. So we did, had, um, on all of our testing, we asked the users to bring their own devices. So they had the accessibility tools that they were used to using, uh, and we could see which different devices they used to engage with. Um, in the in-person testing, a lot of them brought laptops. Um, some of them brought phones or iPads. One fellow brought a laptop, stopped halfway through, didn't like it, and he said, can I just switch to my phone? I use that anyway. So even he assumed that we were expecting a full laptop and desktop experience when really they're just on their mobile devices. And frankly, with a, lo a lot of users that we found preferred their mobile devices because they have more control about how close it is, how big it is, the accessibility tools are just easier there. Um, and finally, emphasize depth over breadth. Really go into and ask uh, how you want to feature, how you want to focus on, how people want to use the small components of your site. Don't get a large, broad strokes of it. Go through for each user and really target on something that you want to understand with them, because they'll be able to uh, give you a better experience. Um, and I really want to empathize or emphasize that uh, user testing with actual users that you're targeting is so, so important here. Um, there's this phrase, uh, nothing with us without us, or nothing for us without us. And here it's engaging the community to actually be interested in and have an investment in your product. And it's making sure that they understand how to use it. It's making sure that you're listening to them. It's really important. Uh, this one is a <laughs> an image uh, of RuPaul in a big blonde wig saying, I don't want to hear any goddamn excuses. So this is it. This is how easy and difficult uh, it can be to build a really beautiful, engaging uh, web application that is accessible. Uh, it's not hard to take the first steps. Uh, as you said before, uh, trying is the most important part. Pushing yourself, pushing the boundaries, and seeing where your application is going to go is really, really, really critical here. So. Uh, for further resources, I would like to emphasize uh, links are contained within this slide deck. There's so many stuff out there. It's amazing. Um, tomorrow, there is another accessibility uh, talk uh, called Future Directions for Accessibility. Today, uh, Empathy and Future Web Accessibility was sadly canceled. I would love to see that again. Um, and there is an accessibility boff, I believe, tomorrow. If you want to come join us, check it out on the board. Yeah, I'm just going to tweet the details. It's not on the... Um application or the website because it was when we scrolled into one of the free slots so I'll just tweet the details but it's at 1545 uh, just so uh, people working with accessibility can meet each other yeah uh, today. today great uh, or you can tweet me or engage there uh, yeah finally I just wanted to say thank you so so much for all of your time and attention